This video is for financial exam candidates who have little to no experience with the Texas Instruments BA2+. I have here a brief list of notes that I call setup essentials. I think you absolutely need to know these things and be comfortable with them. If you're going to sit for a financial exam using this calculator, I'll go through them row by row. And we'll look at, for example, the format variables so we're clear on how you set the number of decimal places and what calculation method your calculator is using. Also, we'll take a very brief look at the time value of money worksheet variables. In terms of my list of setup essentials, here they are. I'll start one row at a time. I'll start with the top. And you notice I've got first here the second function, which not by accident on the calculator is emphasized. We need to use the second function if we want to access any of these secondary functions that are above the primary keystrokes. So this calculator, in a way, really has double the number of functions that we're looking at, or almost double, because most of these keys have either a value or function primarily, but then right above them, they have some secondary function available to us. So for example, right here is the multiplication symbol. If I just want to multiply numbers, right above it is the factorial. So if I want, let's say, 5 factorial, I would enter 5, and now I know I want to access that secondary function here above the multiplication symbol. I need to go up here and hit the second key. And notice I get my visual feedback that I'm now operating on the secondary functions. And then I go back and select my factorial. Calculator returns for me 120. That is, in fact, 5 factorial. I've also got here in the top row, store and recall. In case you want to use these, the reason I like them is that some of us, if we have a complicated calculation, which can be the case in the FRM exam, we'll take interim values, write them down on paper, and then rekey them in when they need them. I don't like to do that because it introduces a chance for error, either in transposing the number or rekeying it in. So we do have memory variables available to us, one through nine. I usually only need to use one or two. But that means that if we're doing a calculation and we have an interim value, right, let's just say 589.7, I can store it in, then I just need to pick one through nine. I pick the first one. I have stored that number in that memory variable one. That means that I can go do some other calculations. And then when I want to come back and retrieve it, I just say recall and I just specify which one. Recall memory one brings that value back so that it's available to me. Third thing I have here is the display labels. So display labels is the row above our primary display here. Most of it is can't see right now, but the calculator's got several indicators going all the way across the top. These are valuable because they give us visual feedback. We know from experience that candidates sometimes or oftentimes will do a calculation and they won't get the same result that everyone else seems to be getting and can't figure out why. Oftentimes, the reason is that the calculator has some setting that is unusual or that they're not used to. And oftentimes, they would know that if they looked at the display label indicator. So, for example, mine here says BGN at the end. That happens to mean that in terms of my time value of money worksheet, I'm set to annuities due or what we call in advance. So at least for the FRM and most financial exams, that would be unusual unless we really wanted that. Typically, we want ordinary what we call in arrears. So this indicator would be sort of a red flag on my calculator. I don't want that. Now I can go in and change that setting. But now I'll move to my second row of my notes. I also could just reset the calculator if I already know that I'm comfortable with the defaults, which I am generally. My reset calculator, you can see this command here, second. I go down to reset, and then it gives me a question mark, and I say enter to confirm. And now you'll notice my beginning indicator disappeared. The calculator reset back to default values, including my time value of money, defaulted back to ordinary or in arrears and then and that's typically what I want that setting right there explains no small amount of uh, discrepancies in calculations sometimes so go to the next row here very important uh, second 
format is a set of variables. So notice, second, I go down and set format, and my display labels, always helpful to look at this, is telling me, okay, I can enter to confirm. Up and down arrow means I have a set of variables I can change here within the formatting. And so I, it starts with the number of decimals, and the default here is two, and that and it's even illustrating with by example, and that's why I'm getting uh, two decimal, uh, I'm going out two decimal places. So for example, I can just enter to four, enter, and I've changed to four, right? So if I come out and say one divided by three equals, I'm getting four decimal places. We are in formatting, so important to remember, this is cosmetic formatting. The calculator is storing the true 0.333 repeating, and then in terms of cosmetic formatting, I only have it set up to four decimal places. It's not truly in substance rounding the number. So now if I go back to into, sec into second format, back to decimal, you'll notice I've got this. Many people do prefer setting this to floating. So if I hit nine and enter, then I get floating, or what you can think of this as flexible. And in this case, if I do one divided by three equals, notice this number truly is 0.3 repeating. So the calculator is giving me going all, all the way out to nine. But if I just did, let's say one divided by eight, I only get the three. Notice the format, the cosmetic appearance is floating to the actual value. Some people really like this. I do not, I like, because I don't like to have to worry about uh, which version I'm looking at. I like personally setting it to four, but I really do think that's a matter of style. So we're still in format. We've got these upper down arrows. So we move through the set of variables, right? If I move down, then I'm at angle units. I'm gonna just go ahead and skip right past that. I go down again. I'm at date formats where I could change to European. I'm gonna skip right through that. Here I have a chance in number formatting to change the comma here to a period. I'm going to skip that as well. And I'm going to get down to here the calculation method, which is significant. And the default you can see here is chain. And the alternative is algebraic operating system. So this refers to the sequence or how we calculate the numbers. And I'm going to use the calculator's example. I'm staying in chain, which is the uh, default. Or I'm going to use the manuals example here. And notice, all I'm going to do is 3 plus 2 multiplied by 4. 3 plus 2. Then I go to multiply, and notice it processed that. 3 plus 2 is 5. It goes ahead and processes the 5 before multiplying by the 4. And so I get 20. So chain did this did this uh, ar ar arithmetic in the order I input it. On the other hand, if I go back into second format, and now I can go down, all the way down to back to calculation method, but it really is just a cycle of variables. So I can go right, I can go up to it right away, right? That's the same as going all the way down to it. Get to chain, and now I can change it, toggle it, to algebraic operating system. And I toggle that with second set. Here's where I set it. And notice it changes now to AOS. I don't even have to hit enter. Now I'm in algebraic operating system. So now we'll take that same arithmetic here, three plus two. And now I go to multiply. It doesn't process that. It waits. I hit the four equals, and now instead of 20, I get 11. Why is that? Well, for the same reason that it waited. Algebraic operating system gives precedence, higher priority to multiplication and division over addition and subtraction. So it did the two, plus, two multiplied by four is eight, and then went back and added that to the three to get 11, as opposed to under chain, where it did three plus two is five, Multiply by that is 4 is 20. Okay, 
So I am not going to advocate a method there because there's good reasons for either. Plenty of people prefer the algebraic operating system. I like the discipline of the chain, which requires me then to use parentheses. So I'm just going to go back into second format. And this time I'll just go all the way down to it. Second set puts me back in chain. Don't even need to, don't even need to hit enter. And I'm back. Okay, so that's the second format variables. Again, I have highlighted the two that I would like you to be mindful of. Number of decimal places you want to look at. And then the calculation method. You definitely want to get clarity and practice. And really probably just settle into one of those as you practice with the calculator. Here... I've just got a reminder of the two different types of clears because I think many of us are by habit used to just clearing the entry down here in the lower left. But you do have, if you're not aware, you do have just sort of a backspace key. You don't have to clear the whole number. Uh, oftentimes the typos are just of a certain keystroke so we can do one uh, character at a time here with the backspace. Next row here, we have a pair of inverse functions. And they are right here. Notice primary function is ln, so that's natural log. And then the second function right above it is the inverse of the natural log, which is the exponential function. These are inverse functions of each other. The reason I'm highlighting them is that this is continuous compounding, which we do use in finance often. So, for example, if I want to continuously compound at 6% over one year, $100, I need to use the e raised to the x power, right? So I would do that with 100 multiplied by, now here's my 6%. I'm just going to enter my 6% in. And then I need here that second function, the exponential function. So I just do second, hit the ln because I'm really accessing the exponential function. And that is giving me e raised to the point to the 6%. And so then I hit equals and I get my answer. $100 continuously compounded at 6% over one year ends up being at the end of the year $106.18.37. Next row here, in case you don't know, this key here is how we negate and make negatives, right? You might be tempted to say, if I want to input a five, a negative five, I might, you might be tempted to go, okay, negative five, but you're not going to get that answer. You, you want to hit the number in and then negate it with the uh, plus negative. So I have the negative 5 entered. And then finally, in terms of essentials here, we have the time value of money. And that is the first, second, third row here. Time value of money, that's a generic concept which maps to bonds, right? We have five keys. N maps to number of uh, periods. The uh, interest per year, that maps to yield per period. Present value, PV is present value and time value of money, generically maps to price or current price. Payment maps to coupon. And future value maps to face value or par value of the bond. And we can clear all of these with second clear time value of money. We have a couple of defaults here that I will recommend you never change. And that is, notice I'll access these defaults by going right above, right above the uh, yield per period is this P slash Y. So I'll access it directly. Second, P slash Y. And what I'm getting here is payments per year. And the default is one. And we want to keep it that way. And you notice I've got up or down, so I can move to C slash Y. You can see that's compound periods per year. And the way we end up using the calculator is we end up dealing with one payment per period and one compound per period. So we don't want to deal with the sophistication. We do our own translation into the periods. These values should stay one. So that means. For example, if I'm going to price a 30-year zero-coupon bond at 8% yield, I translate into periods myself. 30 years, if I'm going to do semi-annual periods, is 30 multiplied by 2 
equals 60 semiannual periods, and that I treat that as the number of periods. So I'm doing the adjustment myself as the inputs, and for that reason, we want to keep these two values at 1. It keeps things simpler, actually, in the long run. And then my yield here is yield per period. So if I have 8% yield, I put the 4 in there, and I it's a zero-coupon bond. I'll put zero um, for payment, and then let's just say the face value is 100. I entered that as the fourth keystroke, and the way the time value money we have five of them. We generally can, generally can input four and solve for the fifth by hitting compute and then getting our present value, which is our price. In this case, the price is about $9.50. And you can see here, remember we had this annuities due versus an ordinary, which is a setting we don't want to set inadvertently. We, may, we want to be conscious as to what the choice is. And that I can access that directly, right, by going second. And then we have here, it's a secondary function above payment, right? Makes some sense as to where it is because it speaks to whether the payment or cash flow is at the in advance or in arrears. And then I get here what, what I have it set to. I have it set to ordinary in arrears, but... It's a toggle, and I switch these toggles with the set command here. So if I go second and set, it, it switches. I'm now in annuities due. It being a toggle, I do that again, and I notice I got the visual indicator. I go back to ordinary in arrears, and I'll leave that the way it is. And I'm, I make a point to check my display label. Okay, I'm not in annuities due. I'm in ordinary. And then you'll notice I've also got down here, a recall because I can actually go and recall here my present value. So that's pretty cool, right? Not only do we have these nine general memory variables, but we can recall our time value of money variables as well. So those are my setup essentials, just the essentials of the key. Make sure that you go into format and that you're comfortable with setting the decimal places and you get a preference there for floating or fixed. Make sure definitely that you can uh, uh, that you can chain toggle the calculation method, and that you decide on a method. And you probably want to stick to it. Make sure that you've practiced continuous compounding. And finally, you want to do plenty of practice questions with time value of money, so you're very comfortable with these keystrokes. So more calculator videos are coming. And please subscribe to the channel so you can be notified of the next one.